Hello there. I'm Laura Lee. Thanks for tuning in to Conversation for Exploration. We have with us tonight Bruce Lipton, cell biologist and frequent and favorite guest on this show. About a week ago, Bruce and I were chatting, and he mentioned that some of the new data coming in from the Human Genome Project and all that research is confounding the standard scientist, but could be interpreted to support Bruce's thesis that he's been sharing with us for the last decade. And that is that those genes are very malleable, that they actually respond and interact with the environment, I suppose with consciousness as well. And uh, I said, Bruce, stop. Do this on the show. You could spend an hour with me, and I would love that privately. But really, everybody wants to hear what you have to say. This is all important research to us all. I'm sure the popular press only shares a part or sometimes often the wrong story. So let's let's hear it on the show so everyone can hear what you have to say. And uh, tonight's the night. We get to hear Bruce's latest take on that new data coming in and how it actually fits the thesis he's been promoting all along. Welcome back, Bruce. Thank you very much, Laura. You know, I only have the sketchiest idea of what the Human Genome Project is all about. And perhaps that's where we should begin. Why don't you explain what it is what it's finding that's confusing the scientist, and then how we can interpret that in the light of your thesis. And I also want to let everyone know that the previous interviews that you've had with us, and they're numerous, are available on our archives and through uh, cassette tape. And you've also got your videos that are very popular that the radio bookstore sells. Uh, 800-243-1438, which lays out a lot of your research. Um, not all of it, because you're adding to it all the time, but lays out a lot of your research. So that's another way to get the full picture of what you have to say. But let's begin with the Human Genome Project for tonight. Well, it was an exciting adventure. It, you, we all planned and heard about it for for a number of years. It was about you know over a decade in, in the process. And w everybody was like gung-ho to get to the end of the project. Now, we really have to take a step back and say, what is the Human Genome Project? And what was its mission statement? What was the, why did we even invest the billions of dollars to do this? So we start off with the Human Genome Project. It's basically a project where the, they were extracting the DNA out of a human cell uh -huh. and then uh, identifying the segments of the DNA that are called genes and making a compendium, like a, like a, it's just like an index of <laughs> all the different genes that make up a human. Now, there was a reason behind this, and the reason behind this was not just to, to do it because it could be done, but the reason behind it was this, and, and, and this is where the fun part comes in, because it's like a cosmic joke. It's, a, uh, it's like a universe humor, I refer to it. It's, that's something like uh, when you could bet the, the farm and the kitchen sink that, that it's going to turn left, and uh, with all your awareness and all your knowledge, you know the thing is going to turn left, and, and just when you make the bet, it, it turns right. And, and it, because it blows you for a loop because it says somewhere along the line your beliefs were so far off that you didn't even know, you know, you couldn't even uh, understand why it did that. Well, here's the issue. The result of the Human Genome Project, this compendium, turns out to be a cosmic joke. Okay. Cosmic well, life has that, that tendency, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But it's great because it makes us stand up and pay attention. There's something that we presumed to be a truth and then find, uh-oh, we presume the game totally wrong. interesting, yeah. So, so the presumption is simply this. The, 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 the genes, what are the genes? First of all, the genes are blueprints to make the proteins of the body. And the reason why that's important is that the proteins of the body are the building blocks that give us our behavior and our characteristics and uh, everything that you see about an organism when you look at it, the character, shape, and behavior and actions are uh, some way related to the protein building blocks. So that knowing the, the uh, blueprints for the building blocks would help us uh, then say if there was something wrong with one of the uh, organisms that by changing this building block for another mm -hmm. building block I can make a better or correct the organism's defect, whatever. So the compendium was this belief. In addition to genes that make proteins, there are genes that control the patterns and the unfolding and why we look like a human and a, and a chimp looks like a chimp and, and, a, and a snail looks like a snail because there, there are genes that control the patterns and there are also genes that presumably control the behavior. So the issue is the, the belief system. Genes 
are uh, providing the structure and function of the organism, and that you go from more primitive organisms to more complex organisms, you're going to see a change in the genes. And that change could be under, you know, looked at and understood as to how evolution occurred and how everything is interconnected, how chimps and humans differ, maybe looking for the genes that make us so special. And so basically, that was the whole, thing, the whole idea. It's just let's take a look and see if we can find all the pieces and parts that make up the human. Because and that's what humans do. We like to puzzle things out. We like to get to the control switches. Maybe well, the control uh, switches, yeah, that, that was the part. <laughs> yeah, so that if we don't like this gene over here, we can change it. If we don't like this behavior over here, we can change it. If we don't like this propensity over here, we can change it. Maybe the computer model was limiting us. We felt that the genes were like a computer model. Going I still feel right. they are. I, I still feel that the genes are yeah. actually the, the, the programs in place, OK? But let me make my point. Yeah. We, if we don't like something, go in and rewrite the program, get different results. However, we don't expect a computer program to be interactive and to adapt itself to changes in the environment. So maybe that's where the model is limiting to us. Yeah, I, I think basically the model is, there, there's two aspects of the computer control model that are completely different. And this is where I think this is the point that you're bringing up and where science made a mistake. There are two ways to look at a computer-controlled organism. One is say that all the programs are, in, are inside the machine. You just push the start button, and, and the computer program runs the machine, period. And the other process is that it's a computer, but there's a programmer involved, and the programmer and the computer are not the same thing. So basically, conventional thought is uh, the pharmaceutical industry's belief, of course, that it's a self-contained program, that it's a self-running uh, computer. That's a, basically how, what the belief is. Okay. Yeah. And 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 it turns out this is that's the whole failure fell apart on this reason. This is this is the this is where the joke comes in. The complexity of a human is some way related to the fact that we have over seventy thousand different proteins, maybe ninety thousand. Okay. There's supposed to be a gene for each protein. Well, that's then, kind of like the Chinese language. If there's a character for each word, as opposed to characters for letters, and then combinations of letters create words, which is a more elegant system, yes. you would just become too hot, top heavy at one point. Well, this is, this is, and the top heaviness is this is what they were trying to explain. Why humans are different than snails is that we are genetically so much heavy. more complex <laughs> to provide for you know consciousness and every aspect of human qualities. So the the bottom line is that there's seventy thousand proteins or at least, maybe 90,000. Mm -hmm. And then you figure, well, how many genes do you, you need? 70,000 genes just for those proteins. And then you're going to say, well, how many genes do I need to program this beautiful human complexity? And God, 50,000 genes is an average number that's been estimated. But let's just say 30. And the reason why I say that, if I had 30,000 control genes plus 70,000 genes to make the proteins, then what we expect is this. The human genome is going to have a minimum of 100,000 genes. And here was the cosmic joke. OK. There are less than 30,000 genes. OK, so a third of the estimated minimum number. So obviously, not, not even there. obviously the system is more sophisticated and um, saves space, has a space-saving mechanism Absolutely. than we uh, thought. Uh, it, the complexity, just to let you know the relative nature of the complexity, there's a, a microscopic worm that has been used in a lot of genetic studies because the worm has only 1,029 cells, and it has behavior. So by studying the genes, you can study how the anatomy came about and how the behavior right. in a very small organism. Right. This small organism, Cenorhabditis elegans, little tiny, it's microscopic. This worm with 1,029 cells has approximately 20,000 genes. OK, so complexity of the number of genes and complexity of the organism aren't related. There's not well, a Well, that's what we thought, but yeah. if there are 20,000 genes to make this microscopic organism and only 30,000 genes present to make a human, which is so infinitely much more complex. It's more than a third. So the scale it's only a third more set, uh, genes. So the scale that we had imagined is way off. Way Something off. It, it doesn't work according to what we thought. It's not no. complexity of genes. Yep. And, and, and